Welcome back to uh, Motlow College Theater class. We're starting today on page 327, the last chapter in the book. Today we'll be talking about what it means to be a critic. And this is very summative. We're just sort of going over a lot of things that we've kind of touched on, but we just want to kind of solidify because this is really the goal of the class is for you to walk away and be a more sophisticated critic, uh, whether it be when you're watching a theater production, obviously, <laughs> or maybe you look at a piece of art, you might be able to say, hey, that's absurd. We studied that in theater class. Or maybe when you go uh, and turn on the television, you might get the reference uh, that they have to um, Long Day's Journey Into Night or whatever. Uh, thing we've kind of touched on in class. So hopefully um, you have in some way become exposed to something that makes you think of something in a different way. <laughs> it's a very vague goal, so I guess that makes it easier to achieve. <laughs> All of that to say, uh, let's get started today and see what does it mean to be a critic. So Hamlet is, as I say here, the most celebrated drama in the English language. I would argue the most celebrated drama in any language. Um, it's, of course, by William Shakespeare. Uh, Hamlet is a not, as it's pictured here, a Lego piece. <laughs> he is the Prince of Denmark. Now, hopefully, you've started watching um, some of this David Tennant Hamlet that I have for you here. Um, he, David Tennant, you may like look at him and say, what is he in? Uh, he's popular in BBC, so if you watch BBC shows like Doctor Who, he was um, not the most recent Doctor, not even the second most recent Doctor, but he had a really long run as Doctor Who in the famous British sci-fi. Uh, he also has done um, some other BBC shows that you may have seen him in, but he is a classically changed trained a Shakespearean actor full of wit and I think an excellent Hamlet. Um, of course if you would like to go look up some other Hamlets lots of um, modern day actors have you know taken on the task. Mel uh, Gibson has a ham Hamlet out um, that is uh, I think good. I think Mel Mel Gibson does a good job as Hamlet. It's another one I would recommend. But this one was in our database, so it wins. <laughs> um, I like it because it's a more modern version. You can see him in t-shirt and jeans. It's, it's, uh, it's very down to earth as an interpretation. So it's, let me tell you a little bit uh, about Hamlet. And it is a confusing play. I will openly say that. Uh, you know, pirates show up at one point. There's a lot of subplots and sub subplots that I'm not going to even pretend to touch on. Um, Hamlet, the prince, is the one pictured here. The actual um, opening of the show, which you watched a clip from, a ghost appears and frightens the guards of the palace. And that ghost turns out to be King Hamlet, where Prince Hamlet got his namesake. King Hamlet uh, has come back and he is haunting the halls of his palace. And then, of course, he comes to Prince Hamlet and tells Prince Hamlet, um, revenge, revenge for me. He tells him that his brother, King Hamlet's brother Claudius has put poison in his ear uh, while he was laying out in his garden. So very very specific and Claudius poisons uh, several people uh, in the play at different points. It's kind of his um, metaphor also for the way that he poisons people's minds. He's a very persuasive villain. Shakespeare always writes um, these fantastic villainous roles and uh, you know Claudius is that. Uh, Gertrude is Hamlet's mother. Hamlet's mother um, has, uh, well, Hamlet says it, you know, the shoes aren't even worn out from his father's funeral, King Hamlet, before Claudius uh, and she marry. 
so there's a little bit of speculation. Remember in this time uh, in that the play was written uh, in Renaissance England, a lot of people didn't necessarily marry for love, uh, especially royalty. They married because uh, that was the right thing to do, and that was their duty as English people uh, to do their duty to their country. Um, so that would have been William Shakespeare's sort of um, perspective as he's writing this play even though it's set in Denmark. So she quickly marries um, Ham Prince Hamlet's uh, uncle and um, Hamlet doesn't like it at all and neither does the guard. <laughs> uh, the guard says there's something rotten in the state of Denmark, very famous line, and uh, he's right, right? There's something uh, stinky going on here. So the rest of the play is Hamlet Jr. here, Prince Hamlet, trying to figure out what he ought to do. Obviously, the ghost of his father tells him to revenge. And so he comes to Claudius three different times. The first time to kill him, um, he's praying. And uh, at that time, he would have believed that if, if Claudius was killed while he was praying, he would automatically go to heaven, sort of a super superstition. So Hamlet doesn't kill him then. Uh, another time, he's talking with his mother in a chamber, and there's a person behind a... Um, a wall hanging. If you've ever been um, to to Europe in general, uh, there's beautiful tapestries from these castles uh, that decorate the walls. I mean, just endless needlework. Uh, they're very beautiful. But anyway, somebody was hiding behind one of those tapestries, and Hamlet thought uh, it was Claudius. So he goes to stab him, only to find out that um, it was not. Uh, uh, it was not who he thought he was. <laughs> so it was actually the father of his girlfriend. So that was very unfortunate. And then as a result, his girlfriend um, goes mad. Well, a result of that and the fact that Hamlet's kind of acting mad, uh, you can imagine um, that would be a very disconcerting to be dating a prince and then he goes mad. And so anyway, but she goes super crazy and then she drowns herself. It's not the most uplifting play. I, I don't pretend uh, that it is. Um, so uh, Claudius also tries to sort of cheer up Hamlet several times. He tells him not to go back to the university. Um, he brings in a couple of his friends, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, to try to cheer him up. Um, but they are uh, beheaded. They, they do not succeed in their goal. Um, Hamlet is also trying to be cheered up by that troop of actors that we talked about uh, when we talked about the the play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Um, it, you know, they try to do this little play to cheer him up, and that doesn't work either. So, uh, in the end, uh, what ends up happening is, remember, Claudius likes to poison people. Well, um, Claudius uh, poisoned, of course, Hamlet's drink. They were supposed to have a duel, a fair duel. Um, not Claudius and Hamlet, Claudius's uh, uh, Laertes, his kind of, uh, you know, the king would never just embark in a duel. Um, but Laertes, uh, you know, under Claudius's supervision, they poison the sword and they also poison the drink. Curtiu drinks the drink mistakenly and she dies. Um, Laertes, uh, after he stabbed uh, with the poison, he then reveals that Claudius is the killer. He is uh, the um, evil man that everybody kind of suspects that he might be. And so then um, of course, Hamlet dies as well. Everybody dies. <laughs> uh, uh, this is kind of a, a crass graphic, isn't it? But it helps. It helps you keep it straight. So, um, so the convention of video surveillance, if you didn't already notice in the video clip, I think this is a really interesting way of um, helping to tell the story. Uh, so in this version that you watch clips from, we see clips from what's actually going on in the room, and then we see clips as it appears on the video surveillance footage. Um, and this goes back to that big question of what is real and what is imagined. Um, you know, are we crazy? That's a big question in Hamlet. Who's crazy? <laughs> we know somebody's crazy because something is rotten. Um, but paranoia plays in a lot to Hamlet's character. He's a very paranoid character. And you can imagine um, being a royal person 
and always being watched, how unnerving that must be, right? Your every move. And remember, at this time, it was not a democratic state. It was not, um, you know, didn't have to go through Congress. Uh, anything that Hamlet, you know, decided on a whim, or um, in this case, Claudius, obviously, as the king, uh, anything he thought, if he just decided, you know what, I'm a Protestant, let's kill all the Catholics. Boom, it happened. So people really watch the royalty now. Now we still watch royalty perhaps the same way uh, people watch the Kardashians, not necessarily uh, because there's any direct um, result as a choice of the choices that they make, right? Okay, so going back to our book, um, we are... Um, on page 238. Um, so what do we talk about when we talk about a play? Uh, for Joe Turner's Come and Gone, that was obviously a bit of dramatic analysis that you wrote for me. Um, sorry, not dramatic analysis. <laughs> dramatic analysis is after you watch a, uh, a live theater production. And then you kind of go back and you do an analysis um, based on that drama that you you watched unfold, right? Um, but uh, for Joe Turner, you did more of a literary analysis. You read it, and then as we see on page 238, you asked some of these questions. Do you get it? <laughs> Many of you, uh, you know, went out of your way to tell me that you didn't get Joe Turner's Come and Gone. And I'm sure if I were teaching this in person, some of you would tell me, you don't get Shakespeare. You don't like Shakespeare. Well, it's just one, one lecture, so bear with me. Um, can you visualize it based on what you're reading? Um, do you like it, right? So these will be some of the questions in a vague sense that we talk about today. You can see there's dramatic criticism and play review. This is a job. If you um, are really enjoyed writing that paper or you're really enjoying the course, uh, you may want to get a job at the Nashville scene um, providing uh, criticism, dramatic criticism, based on the plays that you see in the Nashville area. Uh, if you pick up the uh, Nashville scene or you go online, you can see uh, critiques of the plays. So if you go to see a production at TPAC or maybe a production at a local street theater, some one of the theaters in Nashville, you can probably read a critique in the Nashville scene of that show. Um, very common thing to do. But we're going to kind of look at different critical perspectives. And of course, you know, with Hamlet being such a um, famous and meaningful play, it's all very up to interpretation. And so I'll kind of go through some of what I think it is, some of what other um, intellectuals throughout history have, have thought it is. Um, and then, of course, you're definitely uh, have your own interpretation, your own dramaturgy. So um, so hopefully by this point in the course you realize that any piece of art is tied to its culture. It's going to be a reflection of the culture that it's going on in, right? And the big um, issue that Shakespeare writes about a lot is kings and queens, right? The monarchy. To kill a king uh, would be a huge offense, right? What Hamlet Sr. is asking Hamlet Jr. to do is no small task. I mean, it's akin to treason as well as uh, murder, right? Uh, you know, you can criticize Hamlet for not being a man of action, but not many of us are planning to kill any monarchs anytime soon, hopefully. Uh, it's, it's a big undertaking that he sort of spends most of the play kind of, you know, fighting with himself about whether or not he should do it. Um, but many theater artists or artists in general are nonconformists. They write plays in order to change opinions. We talked about that a lot in the modern theater section. Um, so if we look at um, kind of the social issues, what was going on in England and the time that Shakespeare wrote this play? Well, the play was written uh, at the time of Queen Elizabeth's reign, and his... Uh, that that guy down there is peeking over is uh, Henry the Eighth, and he is uh, perhaps the most notorious king in British history. Um, he uh, Henry the Eighth, I am, I am. You know, he had lots of wet wives. There's a modern day sitcom about um, 
about him and it's called the Tudors. It's grossly inaccurate, <laughs> but um, it does tell the basic story of uh, what it might have been like for uh, Henry VIII and all of his wives. He was trying to produce a male heir and as we see Queen Elizabeth, he was unsuccessful. His male heir uh, died uh, young and um, of course Anglicanism came out of this when he um, separated from the Catholic Church and that picture there of the people on the left is his uh, first wife uh, in the kind of sitcom and uh, how uh, you know they struggled and but then he eventually got a divorce well what does all this have to do with Hamlet well Queen Elizabeth you know she is this grown-up daughter of this possibly mad man I mean honestly who kills that many oh, women of his own wives how you know has them beheaded Anne Boleyn you know his own wife uh, so what do you do when a king a person who's supposed to be in authority who's supposed to be this powerful figure what do you do when he is corrupt or in some way um, wrong doing wrong things doing unjust things uh, but Queen Elizabeth you know she suffered with this um, you know she never married she she was the virgin queen and so was part of that that she never wanted to take that risk again of a, a king it was maybe it's that she didn't want to give up her power but she had a court she had a court of people around her um, but this question of um, paternity and uh, is this you know should you do what your father says should you be your father's child you know in some ways Queen Elizabeth wasn't like her father and she made decisions that were different from her father so when um, when you have a, a loved one die someone in your life die and you kind of metaphorically are haunted by them you hear their voice in your head you hear um, the things that they are saying to you uh, and reminding you of and um, you know in some ways I'm sure that Henry the eighth was haunting Elizabeth he was uh, his legacy was there people were comparing her to him he had his advice that he had given her um, he had his mess which she had to clean up right so I think uh, you know anytime that Shakespeare would have written a play it would have had Queen whoever the Queen or King was in mind um, because ultimately that's where his his supreme patronage comes from right uh, the patrons who are then um, doing that to impress the Queen if he falls out of favor with the Queen and the courts no longer are interested in Shakespeare he doesn't get paid anymore so <laughs> uh, that's the direct link there so um, the question in your book is interesting now when a government is tied to a theater in what ways does that limit or affect the theater itself I mean there's not going to be a lot of uh, revolutionary theater in the Renaissance because the royalty was so closely linked with the success or failure of the theater well the same thing uh, can be said of ancient Greece right those patrons those wealthy taxpayers who paid in ancient Greece to support the play if they went and saw the play and didn't like the play they're not going to be patrons anymore and we talked about royal theater right the royal theater being something that was supported uh, as the name ins infers by the royalty so maybe the reason that there's so many revolutionary plays in the 40s and the 50s and these communist plays these uh, propaganda plays uh, is because they no longer have to rely on the patronage of the government now to bring this into the modern day some of the, the community theaters that you go um, patronize you are watching that partially on grants from the NEA government supported uh, plays going on um, you know to what extent does that mean that you have an entitlement to censor the plays that are done right at what point does the audience determine whether or not that play ought to be produced if they are taxpayers right so it's just something interesting to think about watch your local community theater and what kind of plays they're doing are those the kind of plays that you want to see or maybe you could lobby for change human significance um, so we do have you know does the play have a social significance is there a political interest is there um, a point of view being expressed philosophically 
But then on a broader way, Shakespeare is uh, really good about writing universal stories, stories that matter to all human beings. And the best way, I think, for me to demonstrate that is to give you some really famous quotes from Shakespeare and see if they resonate for you. And I'll try to put them um, in n normal language for you. Um, in the first act, scene two, we have Hamlet's first soliloquy, his first sort of pondering, and this very famous um, monologue. It has that uh, moment, that famous line, frailty, thy name is woman, which of course is a feminist. I hate that line, but <laughs> um, he's very obviously mourning his father. And he said um, that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. O oh God, O oh God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. So he's, he's saying, uh, if the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Right? If, if the Bible did not say not to kill yourself, uh, then, then uh, he would basically, is, is what he's confessing there. Um, of course, most of the religions at that time would have believed if, if you killed yourself, you would go straight to hell. Um, uh, he is comparing his King Hamlet uh, to Claudia. Uh, wait, did I say, just say Claudia? Claudio. <laughs> it's not a woman. Claudio. And he says that um, his father was so excellent a king to this Hyperion to a satyr, so loving my mother that he may have between the winds of heaven visit her face to roughly heaven and earth. Must I remember? He He's mad that he's remembering about how good of a man his father is. And that's when um, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules, right? He is saying that it is, his uncle is so unworthy. He's not saying this to anybody but the audience. He's endearing us as an audience by sharing these secrets. Dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor can it come to good, but break my heart. I must hold my tongue, right? So even though he's wrestling, he's comparing his uncle to a beast, to a satyr, uh, he's still, and, and remember we studied the satyr play, the satyr was a perv, he, uh, you know, a joke, and so there's a negative connotation there. Um, he's wrestling with, with what to do. Um, so the second famous um, Shakespeare quote that happens in Hamlet is to thine own self be true and this is actually kind of funny because Polonius the one who gets accidentally stabbed um, he sort of rambles and he rambles in truisms he's giving uh, his son uh, advice Laertes the one who eventually uh, does this duel with um, Hamlet um, but Polonius says, uh, all of these things that you may have heard people say, uh, do not a borrower a lender be, a peril oft proclaims the man, um, thou canst not be false to any man. Uh, but he was actually kind of treated like an idiot in the play. If you, if you watch and pay attention to how the other people treat Polonius, he's sort of treated as, as this constantly talking, obtuse person. So it's a... Uh, he, I, f I have a feeling that when Shakespeare wrote those things, he thought of them as trite little truisms, and now people are embroidering them on pim pillows and saying, oh, William Shakespeare said that, and it's like, well, he kind of thought that was trite, but oh well, you know, within the context, anytime you have a quote, you want to look at it in a context. Um, all right, uh, so we have Act 2, Scene 2. This is a, a song uh, that I sang in the musical Hair. I have of late, and wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, foregone all customs of exercises. And indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth seems to me a sterile promontory, the most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, and remember they would have been outside in the wooden O, and so when he points up and says this excellent canopy, the air, this or hanging firmament, well, you know, we could have actually looked at the clouds, uh, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, right, it was, um, it was painted 
very elaborately the in, inside of the theater roof. Uh, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. Right? And so he's saying, I recognize with my brain that this is beautiful and that I should be appreciative of it and that I should be thankful, but I'm not. Right? Hamlet's being honest. I'm in mourning right now. I understand, you know, that this is good, but it just doesn't feel, and I can't feel anything right now. That's what he's saying. Of course, he's suicidal. What a piece of work is man! How noble in reasons, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? So he's saying once again that he recognized his friends, all of this wonderful things going around him, that he, that he as a human being has these infinite faculties, that, that he has these endless possibilities, but it doesn't change the fact that he feels nothing and that it all is seemingly dust. It's, it's dust in the wind. It's nothing and it's going to fail, which if you've ever been in mourning, um, it may resonate with you. All right, the really biggie, right? Um, Act three, scene one. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep no more. And by that sleep we say, we end the heartache and a thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die to sleep to sleep perchance to dream ay there's the rub for in that sleep of death what dreams may come so he's struggling he's saying a big part of me just wants to be dead and a big part of me doesn't want to be alive another thing to think about though with this beginning line to be or not to be it could also mean to act to take action or not to take action, right? Whether or not to kill his uncle Claudius. Um, you know, he's he's suffering, um, and should he take arms? Should he, you know, arm himself against it? When we have shuffled off this mortal coil, right, his body must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud's man consciously, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay? This is a ladder, poetically. He's listing all of these reasons, all of these things that you have to bear in your lifetime, right? An unjust society, uh, the patient merit that the unworthy takes, right? When other people are taking credit uh, for the things that you do. When he might himself his quietus make, that's what he's calling death, is a quietus, right? With a bear bodkin. A bear bodkin is actually a needle that's being used in leather work. Um, little background lesson. Um, Shakespeare's from Stratford-upon-Avon, and his father was a glove maker. And um, in the glove making in industry, he would have used that bodkin a lot. It's actually a really smelly um, grunt work kind of job. They have to soak the leather in pee. So the house probably that he grew up in would have smelled like pee. And there would have been all these rough, dangerous interest instruments around, such as this bodkin. Uh, John Shakespeare, uh, William Shakespeare's father, was by our standards today illiterate. He was not a learned man. He was not uh, successful. Um, that he was, you know, he kept his family fed, but uh, he lived in a very modest way. This is new place. This is when Shakespeare retired, and in his later age, he um, would have had a garden very similar like this. It would have been a status symbol uh, for him. So when he came back to live in Stratford upon Avon, uh, William Shakespeare did retire in wealth and comfort, um, unlike many of the authors we know. But that's where that that term bear bodkin that would have been um, a leather working tool that most people would have been familiar with but he would have been familiar with especially because of his father's vocation who would these fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after life the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of 
Thus conscious does make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickled o'er with the pale cast of thought. The enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Right? So he's decided um, not to kill himself. Right? He has wrestled with it, but his conscience makes coward of him. If he were not so aware, <laughs> he would not uh, be worried, or if he did not have a conscience, if he didn't have a good moral sense, um, then he would kill himself, right? And that's what he says. So when you go, um, maybe you watch your play, you might have already seen it, but um, anytime you're kind of evaluating a piece of art, ask yourself, is it personable? Is it something that you identify with? Maybe you've never really struggled with your own mortality or you haven't had a death in the family yet. So death isn't really something that resonates with you yet. Well, then maybe, um, you know, God forbid, but maybe when death does come about, maybe you want to go take a look at Hamlet again as a play and maybe it will comfort you. Uh, we do know that Shakespeare his first wife's name was Anne Hathaway, and they had two children uh, who were twins, and one of them died, and the name of that son of the twins was Hamnet, H-A-M-N-E-T, and so he was very thinly veiling, changing the name, and, and this is basically a grieving piece, a piece that he wrote in order to help him work through um, the death of his son, and so uh, it, once again, God forbid that that ever happened to you, but it may help you um, in your temporary mourning to kind of take a look at these really meaningful and moving poetic passages and, and know that people, you know, long ago felt the same way when a loved one died and how hard that could be. Um, all right. <laughs> this is just one other Hamlet uh, quote. There's Laurence Olivier, right? There's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So it's kind of the power of the mind. And he realizes that a lot of what he's struggling with, his inability to act, his mood, all of it is determined in his mind. And yet, right, the same way that he looks at the sky and he knows uh, that it's beautiful, but he still just doesn't feel anything for it, right? Artistic quality. So when you go to see your play or if you're reflecting on a sitcom that you watch or um, a piece of art, does it please you aesthetically? Do you like it for one reason or another, right? Does it please you aesthetically? You know, do you like the costumes? Were they pretty? Were they enjoyable to see, right? Um, was it electrifying or purposeful? Um, you know, this... Uh, scene that I have kind of a clipping from here is when he's talking to the actors and he's telling them um, the very famous monologue about uh, advice to the players and what they ought to do. He tells them that they shouldn't saw the air too much with their hands. In other words, you know, you can use gestures but don't overact your gestures. Fit the word to the action. So if your movements on stage ought to feel natural. Another thing that we touched on in another chapter was William Kemp, his clown that he had hired. Remember, he was the one who did the little dances, and um, he had recently been fired, uh, you know, by the company uh, and presumably Shakespeare as well for doing too many improvs, improvised lines and throwing up and distracting, uh, throwing up lines that aren't in the script. Sorry, he wasn't actually puking on stage. <laughs> Um, but throwing an action that wasn't actually part of the plot. And so Shakespeare kind of works this in and says, you know, meanwhile, some portion of the plot is being uh, ignored or, or hurting because you're too busy upstaging. And so they should only say what is writ down for them, right? And that's it. So Shakespeare's sort of giving advice to actors about the kind of acting that he likes. But let me just say that artistic quality is so individualized. You know, what you think is um, funny, I might not think is funny. I have a really silly little kid sense of humor in general. I like goofy Saturday Night Live stuff, right? Um, 
you may have a more sophisticated humor. You may like um, the New York Times uh, cartoons and uh, the political jokes of uh, Stephen Colbert, right? Maybe you're, that's the kind of humor you like. Or maybe you like fart jokes. I don't know, you know, artistic quality is very individualized. And you feel free to reflect on that and, and you write your paper if you haven't already written your paper. Um, you know, I like the color blue. You might not like blue. So artistic quality is highly individual. The advice that Shakespeare gives to his players, I think, is very uh, universal. And of course, it has that line in there uh, to hold a mirror up to nature, right? Um, so. So an important thing to ask anytime that you're seeing um, a new piece of art is to ask what is the relationship of this piece of art to the genre that it works within, right? What is, um, is it uh, very much like another show? You know, if you watch sitcom, you watch TV, you might say, um, oh, well, that's just a Seinfeld knockoff. I've, you know, that's just a poor man Seinfeld <laughs> or maybe uh, you liked American Idol and you don't like all these repeats of American Idol is maybe going to go off the air but the repeat kind of shows that were modeled after it are going to live on um, so how how is this piece of art like the art that was behind before it right and in what ways um, is it different right in what ways does it break the mold and what ways does it adhere to the mold. So if you're going to watch a romance, right, boy meets girl, right, and maybe they bump into each other and their papers go everywhere, <laughs> right, in what ways does that typical romantic comedy that we see, in what ways does it fit that formula that we all know and love, and in what ways is it different, right, in what ways uh, is it not like that formula. And, you know, as Shakespeare says, as the sun is daily new and old, so is my love of telling what is told. Most pieces of art are not going to reinvent the wheel. It's based on something. It comes from somewhere. But in what ways is it like the things that it's been in the past? Um, another thing to ask is what conventions is it using? Right? Hamlet, when he gives his soliloquies, he talks directly to the audience. And that's a convention that we know. Right. Uh, the, another convention he uses is the cameras, right? In this version that you're watching, uh, he uses the cameras as a convention uh, or meta theater. And as I said, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, right? That's very meta. It's, it's kind of commenting on theater's relationship to itself. And in Shakespeare's uh, Hamlet, we have a play within a play. We have the mouse trap. Uh, which Hamlet gets the players, the actors, to act out how Claudius tells him as a ghost that he has died. And, uh, I'm sorry, I just said Claudius. How King Hamlet tells him that Claudius killed him, right, by pouring the poison in his ears, very specific. And so when the actors start to act that out, Claudius freaks out and walks out. Uh, and so that is very, makes him look very guilty. You know, and we know now, because we've read the entire play, spoiler alert, that Claudius is the bad guy and that we can be sure. But if you can imagine for Prince Hamlet, it must have been very difficult. His mother loves uh, this man, and obviously affectionate towards him, and he, uh, you know, he loves his mother, so he wants her, uh, he doesn't want to hurt his mother. He knows that by killing this king that he would end his own life. Nobody would, you know, respect that sort of, um, you know, uh, anarchy it just wouldn't be accepted. So that's a little bit about the relationship of theater to itself. Um, next, we have entertainment value. Anytime you're thinking about art, does it just amuse you? You know, it may not be pretty. I said that about costumes. It may be grotesque and ugly, but the word entertainment means to hold attention. Maybe you've gone uh, walking and you see a bird on the side of the road that's crawling with maggots. You're not going to take a picture probably and post it on Instagram, but there's a good chance that you'll take just a second to kind of look at it. And it's going to hold your attention and its gruesomeness and its ugliness, right? And the theater of the grotesque is built on this idea that there's something, you know, amusing about a freak show, about a sideshow. Um, and so when Hamlet starts to think about um, 
Hor Yorick. That's the skull there, the very famous silhouette of an actor looking at a skull. It's from Hamlet. And Yorick was the jester. He was the clown that entertained. And, and Hamlet says, poor Yorick, how many times I you know, rode on his shoulders, and here is his skull in my hands. Um, and I, yeah, I kind of did teach Hamlet because it's referenced here on page 332, um, uh, the, the, the tragedians. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, thinking those morbid thoughts, uh, just because something is not pretty or not pristine, that doesn't mean that it's not entertaining in its grotesqueness. So, the Guardian is a very famous paper, and he calls David Tennant's Hamlet twitchy, preening, bright, arrogant, angry, and isolated. Those are very specific adjectives, and when you write your paper uh, or when you start to kind of critique work, think about that sort of specificity, right? Um, he didn't just say David Tennant was a good Hamlet right? That's not something they're going to put as the on the poster, right? Ferguson gets paid for being articulate, uh, calling him twitchy. I totally get that. He's sort of, uh, you know, ADD in a way, looking around, excited and energetic, uh, bright, but he doesn't necessarily limit to positive adjectives. Tennant interprets Hamlet as arrogant, and you can imagine he's a prince, there's a certain level of uh, charming arrogance to any royalty, I would assume. Um, it is the ruling elite, right, that Shakespeare is writing about. So once again, we call that dramatic criticism. After you see a drama and then you critique it, you reflect upon it. Literary criticism is much more common for Hamlet. Uh, any great thinker, of course this is Nietzsche, um, would have reflected on Hamlet. So let me, um, you know, uh, Freud, if you want to kind of look at um, a psychoanalysis of Hamlet, there are lots of those out there. Maybe, you know, what about Hamlet and what was he struggling with psychologically? There's a lot of speculative articles, which is part of the reason why I chose this. But for Nietzsche says, knowledge kills action. Action requires the veils of illusion. That is the doctrine of Hamlet, not the cheap wisdom of Jack the Dreamer who reflects too much and, as it were, from excess of possibilities, does not get around to the action. Not reflection, no. True knowledge and insight into the horrible truth outweighs any motive for action. Right? When you really, truly understand what you're doing, the gravity of your actions, it can paralyze you right? Those moments that truly, truly count and you're called to do something brave, if you fully understand, it can be paralyzing, right? The curse of intelligence, <laughs> the curse of understanding. And, and this is, um, you know, just from reading the play, they derive their understanding. So um, your character analysis would analysis would be considered a, a literary critique. It's something that you've probably done in your English classes. So, um, so a good critic uh, is observant, right? They're specific. They're not just kind of vaguely giving me, um, you know, it was good. I enjoyed it. I think I'll see another. I want you, when you write your critique, if you haven't already, to be sensitive, to be demanding, and to be articulate. That's on page 336, right? Uh, and we talked about this in reference to the Olympics, <laughs> right? Uh, the first time that you watch someone dive off the diving board, you probably say, oh, they should have pointed their toes. Um, you know, you become more and more critical as you watch that Olympian and forget how difficult it is to do. So I want you to be sensitive. If you go to see a musical and there's somebody who sings off key, maybe they sing off key, but are they funny? Do they have other strengths? What did the casting director see when they cast them in that role, right? Um, what strengths do they have? And because it might be more difficult than you think to get up on that stage. But that doesn't mean that you can't comment that they did sing off key. 
some students come and they write these papers and they're just all kindness and sweet saccharine um, niceties you know uh, everybody did so well and it was just a wonderful delightful evening and I just imagine them sipping their tea and sitting on their back porch right you've got to be articulate and you have to be demanding as a critic uh, in order for other people to be forewarned right part of your responsibility is to either say hey go see this show or maybe hey don't go see this show right nothing's worse than somebody telling you it's a great movie and then you go to see the movie and you're like yeah it stinks right so lastly here's sort of the secret of criticism is that you're going to end up telling me something about yourself when you write a critique or when you're your dramatic analysis uh, your character analysis right because you if you wrote over Joe Turner's come and gone and you told me about Seth and you said he's a hard-working man he is a good man he owns his own house he does the right thing he expresses his opinion yeah he's a little grumpy but he is a responsible person well now I know you as a person respect Seth for his responsibility maybe you wrote me about Molly and you said she's a free spirit she has a great time she does whatever she wants I want to be an independent woman like that well I've just learned something about you as a person right so um, theater can be an ink blot, and when all of these critics kind of reflect on Hamlet it tells you a little bit of something about their relationship to their father it tells you about their um, own abilities to make decisions uh, and I probably have told you a lot about myself during this class um, as a result because art is always a mirror if you don't get anything else out of this class remember art is a mirror it mirrors your culture and it is a self-portrait when you look at art you're gonna see something of yourself in there and what you see depends on your psychology and your perspective so uh, as possibly the last lecture in the class I just want to say um, thank you for listening <laughs>